Welcome. So as people are arriving into our webinar, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the Every Learner Everywhere Expert Network powered by ISTE. The Every Learner Everywhere Network recently launched the Expert Network for professional learning and coaching for higher education faculty and leaders to support their students through and beyond the pandemic, including the transition to digital learning. We encourage you to visit the Expert Network website. We are posting that link in the chat currently so that you can get more information and also so you can schedule your coaching session. So welcome to the Every Learner Everywhere Strategies for Success in Online Teaching and Learning Interactive Conference Series. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is Norma Hollaback and I'm the manager of network programs and services with Every Learner Everywhere. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you about Every Learner Everywhere and the mission of our network. Every Learner Everywhere is a collaboration of 12 higher education organizations with the expertise in evaluating, implementing, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of digital learning and its integration into pedagogical practice. Every Learner Everywhere is one of three solution networks sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The other two networks focus on advising and developmental education. Here at Every Learner, we work with colleges and universities to build capacity among faculty and instructional support staff to improve student outcomes with digital learning. Our mission is to help institutions use new technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of increasing student success, especially for first-generation college students, poverty-impacted students, and students of color. A few quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's session, which will be shared after the webinar. Throughout the presentation, we welcome your questions in the Q&A section. If a participant raises their hands during the presentation, we will not be able to unmute you. However, we will be monitoring the Q&A as well as the chat section. As a biology professor and recovering associate dean, I'm excited about today's panel discussion on active and adaptive learning. Our moderator for today's panel is Dr. Megan Tassin, Director for, of the Personalized Learning Consortium at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Megan directs the Adaptive Courseware for Early Success Grant for the Personalized Learning Consortium. In this role, she supports and collaborates with academic leadership from a variety of four-year universities to effectively adopt and implement adaptive learning technologies. Her work centers on enhancing pedagogy, closing achievement gaps, improving accessibility, and ensuring that students from all walks of life have the support and resources necessary to graduate. Megan is a social scientist by training with expertise in qualitative and mixed method research. She has taught introductory and upper level courses at the University of Northern Iowa and Georgia State University. In addition to project management and sociological research, she has extensive experience in program evaluation, faculty development, instructional support, and active learning communities. She has her PhD from Georgia State University and an MA from the University of Northern Iowa. Today's panelists are Dr. Peter Van Lusen, Director of Learning Experience and Student Success in Ed Plus at Arizona State University, and Susan Adams, Associate Director of Teaching and Learning at Achieving the Dream. Dr. Van Lusen collaborates closely with academic departments and faculty on student success achievements uh, initiatives, sorry about that, <laughs> across diverse modalities and disciplines. His recent projects focused on collaborating on adapt adaptive curriculum and courseware development, including designing MOOCs in a foreign language and spearheading innovative digital educational experiences for broad audiences. Before joining ASU, Peter worked as assistant director in the Office of Instructional Consulting in the School of Education at Indiana University and previously taught middle and high school German. Peter holds a PhD in Instructional Systems Technology from Indiana University Bloomington. His research interests include faculty development, instructional technology, instructional design, and innovative teaching and learning in face-to-face -face, hybrid and online formats. As Associate Director in the Office of Instructional Consulting at ATD, 
Susan manages projects and programs designed to build institutional capacity to support intentional integration, professional development, and engagement of full-time and part-time faculty in fostering inclusive, student-focused college cultures. Susan produces dynamic thought leadership around instructional design and faculty engagement to both accelerate and sustain better student outcomes at ATD institutions nationwide. Susan earned an MED in Student Affairs Administration from the Woodring College of Education, Western, University, Western Washington University, and a BA in English Literature and Women's Studies from the University of New Hampshire. I am now gonna handle it over to Megan. Thank you so much, Norma, and thank you for those introductions. You make us sound good. <laughs> and we are good. <laughs> I'm glad to be joined today by both uh, Susan and Peter today. And thank you to our audience members for joining us this Friday afternoon. As Norma mentioned, I am Megan Tassine. I'm the director of the PLC at uh, APLU. Sounds a lot shorter when we use those acronyms. Uh, we are one of the partner organizations of the Every Learner Everywhere Network. And I am very pleased to be joined here today by some of our field experts uh, talking about the benefits and advantages of adaptive and active learning and what that looks like in the classroom and on your campus. Uh, as, as Norma mentioned, we'll start with some questions of our own, but we would like your questions as well. Uh, please prioritize putting those in the Q&A, uh, but also we'll be monitoring the chat. So uh, without further ado, let's get started and have a conversation today. Uh, I'll go ahead and just open it up to uh, both Susan, but if you could both just briefly introduce yourselves. I know we had some introductions, but just briefly speak to yourself, who you are and what your relationship is to this work. And then we'll move to Peter. Great. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I've been working with the adaptive learning technologies since my days at Portland State University, where I was senior instructional designer working on the initial grant that kind of brought this technology to the field of higher education. Um, and that, that, that's where we got to experiment and kind of start from the ground up. How is this technology going to work in the classroom? And boy, did we learn a lot in those two years. Um, and so I was able to take some of that research uh, and also that uh, expertise and understanding from the instructional design lens uh, to achieving the dream where we moved on to the second phase of the grant, bringing in different institutions to take it more to scale and continue to uh, look at the data, uh, look at the possibilities and to try experimentation around how we can integrate this in the classroom effectively. So I'm excited to be here today to share some of those uh, learnings as, as we move forward through the questions and the conversation. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Susan. Peter. Yeah, thank you, Susan. It's always good to hear a fellow instructional designer and very similar to my experience. So again, uh, my, I work in the office called the Ed Plus, which is a service unit, unit to the university. And in that role, we partner with the, uh, different academic departments on implementing, in this case, adaptive active solutions. So for us, adaptive active is really a, uh, directly aligns with our charter here at ASU, which focus on access to education as well as student success. And in particular, we, as part of the grant, which was uh, represented by Dale Johnson uh, earlier here at ASU, uh, we focus on the gen ed courses that we have, large enrollment courses. Uh, one of our challenges is that we uh, have large enrollment courses, often with 300, 400, or even more students. And so we looked at the adaptive active uh, methodology as a solution for that. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to share a little bit more about the outcomes a little bit later on. But just to help people understand a little bit the context, uh, we have developed over 25 adaptive active courses. We are working on an adaptive undergraduate biology degree, which some people call the biospine. And we have about annually about over 30,000 students go through the adaptive active, uh, I guess, courses, if you want to say so. So it's quite some of the scale that we have to deal with. And we do this now on ground, immersion, as well as online. Thank you. Thank you both. Appreciate that additional context. Uh, Susan, let's go ahead and start with you. So uh, a lot of times these terms get thrown around and uh, folks uh, have different definitions for them as well when we're talking about both active and adaptive learning or even understanding the distinction between the two. Uh, for our audience today, can you offer us a distinction between these terms, active and adaptive learning from your perspective? Great question. 
Active learning is about putting the student at the center of their learning, right? So that's sort of the, the operating definition that we can all imagine. And so how that plays out with adaptive is by placing students at the center of their learning, we want to give them the agency to direct their own learning. Uh, do that as many ways that we can. And that's done beautifully inside of the classroom when you get to bring the students uh, a set of questions, bring them through a cognitive process, um, where they get to relate or, or take the agency to relate to the content being presented to them in such a way that becomes meaningful and relevant to them. Adaptive technology is a great opportunity for students to actually have their own pathway of learning, right? So when you look at adaptive learning courseware, uh, students are engaged in, I almost want to call it the Rolls Royce of textbooks, <laughs> where they get to engage in content in such a way that what their answers uh, Get direct where their questions are going to come. So, for example, if I answer a question that is difficult um, and I'm not answering it correctly, um, instead of getting it wrong, I'm going to be giving some remedial questions to then help me master that same content, right? So it becomes personalized and responsive to my own thinking and learning process um, and helps direct my own learning, which makes it an active uh, of deployment, right? So it makes it an active technology. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we go, but typically a faculty member, not typically, but often a faculty member will have students go take the adaptive courseware experience prior to coming to class. So another distinction is when they come to class, they're prepared with the content, they're understanding it at a certain level in which then active learning strategies inside of the classroom can occur. Um, so that's another way we like to think about the distinction between active and adaptive. It, adaptive technology both allows for active learning to happen, um, but also inside of the experience of being in an adaptive learning courseware experience as a student becomes active for themselves, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and Peter, you can riff off that as well. <laughs> no, that was very beautifully explained. So I think one way I, I like the adaptive technology is really there to provide the right lesson to the right student at the right time. And that's the really fundamental to this is that, okay, personalized instruction is more effective than I guess generalized instruction and so on. And what we found, in, and that might be a little bit uh, in addition to what you said, Susan, is that adaptive technology can, is very good at certain things, but not at all things. And active learning is really good at certain things, but not at all things either. So we really looked at this model as a combination of things where we focused adaptive technology is really good on the fundamentals when we talk instructional design language, lower Bloom's taxonomy levels. But then the, the in-class or the active Active learning components really good at the collaboration as well as the higher order thinking kind of learning that needs to happen as well. So that's pretty much the only thing I would like to add as well. So, thanks, Peter. Um, so. One of the things that we often run into APLU, and I know some of our network partners as well, we work with a lot of different universities, and I know you're working with, with folks on the ground at, at ASU, is um, when you're having conversations about these different technologies or these approaches are, why should I do this work? Um, how is it gonna benefit me? How is it gonna benefit my students? How can would potentially benefit the campus? Um, so from your perspective, what would you say are the top benefits of adaptive learning technologies uh, to faculty and to students? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if you, if you don't mind, Susan, I'm going to start answering this one. So, yeah, so there are num numerous uh, benefits uh, to faculty as well as other stakeholders. You know, and as I mentioned, one of the main challenges that we have here at ASU is the scale that we are, are working with and trying to provide a personalized experience with several hundred students in the classroom tends to be a challenge and uh, also mostly not very effective and efficient, right? So for that very reason, using this adaptive active approach, the adaptive technology can uh, provide the fundamentals for each individual student. And that's important to us, particular if you look at the demographics of our enrollment and their backgrounds. We have a very diverse background, uh, as well as uh, if you look at our mission, which is access to education, we have pretty much 95% uh, acceptance rate at ASU. So we get people with diverse backgrounds and preparations in the same classroom, which are then uh, traditionally were taught in large enrollment lecture style. So now with the adaptive component that uh, we were able to change that. So top, uh, what I say, top benefits is, okay, we are able to provide a more personalized experience 
uh, for the student, but also for faculty, they can actually see that their students are learning and they can focus and then see the enjoyment of the act, uh, that often happens in the act of learning within the subject matter. So that's, uh, I think, probably the most that I hear faculty say is the great thing. Hey, I since I really see my C student learning, they're really excited and that's great. Some other benefits of the adaptive technology is definitely uh, the data that these uh, tools provide. Since these are digital, we often uh, can, we pretty much can track every student and can identify the try, uh, struggling students very, very early. So if we have large enrollment, we can see who is doing well, who is uh, not doing well. And based on that, we can uh, form interventions or faculty can think about interventions. So they might say, hey, Peter, you seem to be a little bit struggling today. You know, why don't you come to my office hours? Or why don't you talk to the TA? Why don't you go to tutoring and these kind of things? So, and in addition to that, probably the last benefit that I'm going to mention is that with the adaptive technology, we as a, uh, what is our, the way we implement it, we have faculty committees collaborate on what's happening within the curriculum. And so there's some kind of aligned curriculum that is uh, carefully reviewed by the academic department and agreed upon as well, which has been, uh, so not everybody starts from scratch, if you want to say so. Susan, what are your benefits? Thanks, so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I would say you pretty much covered them all. Um, I think that that last piece is, I really want to just amplify, there's an opportunity for a real faculty learning community to emerge with this, um, especially when you're taking it at scale. And the idea is when you look at the adaptive learning courseware, sometimes it is a, the textbook content that you've actually already been teaching, but it's added this adaptive technology to it. Um, but there's opportunities to be able to change some of that content to be more responsive to that content emerging, right? So as we move forward in our field as experts and be passionate about our content, it does change over time. Um, so that is also possible to be able to say, how are we going to leverage this particular content? How are we going to maybe change it too as we move forward? And, and because it's in this digital space, it has that uh, possibility to be versioned, shall we say. Um, and that's done beautifully when you have a community of experts uh, in your field that are, you know, corralling and focusing their energies around this content together and can watch, you know, how students are responding and then make decisions accordingly. So that, that's the benefit that I see. And that does take some support around getting those faculty communities together. Um, and that's what we're here also to say is there's, there's the, the support there and possibilities for helping that to, to come into fruition. Yeah, I think that's a really important point and so sometimes overlooked when we're thinking about well, what are the benefits of faculty is really this collaborative approach of thinking about teaching differently, right? That uh, teaching does not have to be done in isolation uh, by a single faculty member. Uh, you've got resources on your campus that you can connect with, of course, whether it's your Center for Teaching and Learning and Instructional Design folks, but you also have your fellow colleagues who are teaching some of the same courses or, you know, other courses that are uh, sequential in, in your program. One of the things that we've also been hearing um, from the institutions that we've been working with at APLU and some of our grant work is kind of going through the process of learning about these technologies and these practices. Their faculty are coming together and they really feel like they're going through a self-reflective process and really learning about what others are doing and it's been really rewarding and engaging for them and they're also learning more about what works best for their students and for their program to really kind of design um, a curriculum that makes sense from one course to the next and also meets the students uh, needs and also makes things easier for some of the faculty right so you've had a conversation one time with some faculty like but I cover that in my class and it's the next one you don't you don't need to do that right um, so or you can but let's work together on, on what makes sense in terms of coordinating those things so it is consistent across the board so um, again that's community effort and that that is kind of creating a, a bit of cultural transformation and change within those departments and on those campuses so I appreciate you both speaking to that um, Peter you'd also mentioned uh, the benefits of data and Susan you'd also talked about you know we're learning about how students are doing and how faculty can kind of respond to that I'm hoping uh, Susan that you can speak to from again from some of your experience of you know what do you know these technologies and these practices of adaptive courseware um, and, and specifically um, how is that going to potentially change the classroom experience for a faculty member of what that looks like how they're teaching um, as well as um, and we can talk about the, the student experience to how the, the, the traditional model versus this new model might look different for them. Mm, that's great. 
Oh, there's so much I could say about that. I'm trying to think about which way to enter that question. Megan, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, a lot of it depends on the design, right? So I'm going to be the instructional designer now, put that hat on in a stronger way is there's a real choice point. Um, is this adaptive learning courseware going to be something that will introduce content to the students? Would it be something that would be a reinforcement? Uh, is it gonna be used as an assessment? Um, or overarchingly, would it be something that gives you as feedback to help inform um, what the content would be in the classroom, right? So when I think about where, I guess what I'm getting at is where do you place the adaptive learning experience that the students go through in the, in the course itself? Um, and I mentioned earlier, we often see it done prior to the lecture. So students arrive to class at sort of a similar level, regardless of their um, uh, what they've come with, they've all experienced something and gotten to a level of mastery inside of the courseware to then come to what we hope is a level playing field inside of the classroom. So that can then inform what you're going to do on that given day. So another example would be, I noticed that 75% of the students got a really struggled with this particular concept. And I just discovered that tonight you know, at seven o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and shift my lecture tomorrow morning or in general, I'm gonna give the first 10 minutes of class to address those misconceptions that I'm clearly seeing in the dashboard of the courseware. So that's a great, like, you know, it just in time learning that gets to happen um, with the adaptive courseware and where it gets placed in how you're gonna teach the course. Um, and then like Peter said, it also helps with the intervention piece. Um, so I've also seen faculty, um, and this kind of gets into deployment questions that might come up in our audience, is how are students actually doing this? When, when are they going to do this work? Um, and I think Dale actually uses this example a lot, and I can't remember the faculty member's name, although I've met her. Um, Peter, you might remember this, where she actually has during class time, students are in a laboratory, circled computers at a desk, um, and they are taking the courseware. They're actually answering the questions. And she walks around along with her TAs and does, you know, clarifies any misconceptions that come up. She'll notice patterns right on the fly and then stop everybody for a moment and do a quick five minute to 10 minute lecture. Again, helping with those misconceptions. And that is active learning, right? Like, and that's active teaching to be in such a responsive space that this allows you to do in a more effective and efficient way. That's one example, and I'm sure Peter has more, and I have a couple more, but I'll stop there. Yeah, Peter, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question as well, um, specifically thinking about, you know, how faculty are using some of that data and doing interventions in the classroom, and, and potentially even how ASU has been thinking about doing it at, at a higher level, at the institutional level of using that data. Yeah, uh, so... Data, I mean, as I said, uh, one of the, you know, one of the good things and also the challenges is of these digital platforms is that we have a lot of data and uh, maybe sometimes too much data. So some of the, uh, it's really hard sometimes to find the right questions. So the, from instructor level, and like from a faculty perspective, I think there are three questions is really when you look, it's imagine yourself sitting in a, in a lecture hall, you have hundreds of students in front of you and I'm an instructor myself. So I look at these faces. And so I don't know who really, who is learning, who uh, who's struggling, uh, what are they struggling with? And then as an instructor, how can I help them, right? So these are really the questions that I have as an instructor when I, when I teach and so on. And if you look at, you know, your faces and so on, on, you don't you're not really sure but due to the data that you're given getting from um, the adaptive uh, courseware and and so on you can really quickly identify who's struggling uh, who's on track and so on as well so that's really what Susan was mentioning us too so some of the things that we are uh, working on as well have started uh, implementing uh, with uh, some of our math classes in particular. So because we have so many people going through this, we are able to start a little bit predicting whether people are on track of to be successful in the class or not. So, and what, based on that, we can create early identifiers and, uh, and maybe interventions to keep people on track to be uh, successful in the class. So, 
Uh, part of our, our approach is that we are working closely with our institutional research group. It's called the Action Lab. Uh, and they, are, they help us create, like uh, or us as an administrators, as well as uh, instructors, create meaningful dashboards. And these dashboards, we can see it quickly identify students who, uh, you know, who are doing well, who are not doing so well, and who could need some help as well. So it's really like an early uh, indicator of interventions as well. So that's really from the instructor level. Um, and that has been quite successful in particular in math and so on, where we have quite a large number of students and uh, defined these uh, uh, predictive analytics fairly well. On another level, you know, of course, uh, that data can help you measure success. Uh, and depending on how you measure success, uh, then you can, you know, we can look at student performance, retention, you can look at uh, diversity and equity, uh, uh, the performance of different groups and these kind of things as well. So that's something we are ca tracking carefully as well as informing how we would then either form an intervention or redesign the course material as well. So. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I, you, make, you got me thinking on some of the things both of you are talking about. So I'm going to, I know I sent, shared some questions earlier, but I'm going to pivot a little bit based on the, our dialogue here. Um, what we've been hearing from lots of faculty sometimes and what you're describing, uh, you know, it is a lot of data and it is a lot of information. Faculty are already doing so much, right? Especially if you are learning a new technology um, for the very first time, um, you know, and really thinking about how to get how to get started with all of this work. Um, you know, and, and for instance, you know, we have conversations with some of the faculty as well as, you know, they're, they hear course redesign. That's a huge undertaking, right? Um, but you know you don't necessarily have to do it all at once. So I guess in terms of thinking about you know a faculty or a program, um, you know department chair, you know is coming to you and asking you like how do I get started on this work in a way that's um, you know actually practical, right? Um, in terms of timing and, and I don't have to like you know bite off more than I'm going I need to chew. Like so, uh, what would be your advice for folks who want to get started um, but maybe don't necessarily have you know they don't want to do it all at once. Um, Susan, we'll start with you. <laughs> oh, okay. You're welcome. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I'm, I bet you someone's going to throw in the chat because I'm going to ask them to the implementation guide, um, but also the backwards design workbook um, are some great places to start just for some assets, but I'll speak to that. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you saying, Megan, starting small. Um, and that's really important. Uh, so th there is sort of a, a step in saying, you know, what problem are you trying to solve, right? That you, that we believe that adaptive could help support in, in solving that. Um, and that can be all kinds of things, um, DFW rates and, you know, student success uh, 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 data points to increase that or close the gaps um, for you. And also to make your teaching experience richer. Um, so I, I would recommend, if you can, to talk to an instructional designer and or your colleagues um, who have used the, the technology before to be able to talk through, let's look at your whole course and where can be ways that we might insert one module, right? So maybe this particular concept is misconstrued, um, students don't understand it, it's one of the most difficult, starting with just that. And having one module be an adaptive um, courseware piece um, would be a great way to begin, uh, both in understanding what it is that um, this, this content can do for the students, how are they going to respond, how are my particular students going to respond, and experiment with just one week. Um, so that, that's what I kind of mean by baby steps. Um, I also want to address that concept of all of a sudden I have all this data, what do I do with it? That can be super overwhelming as well. Um, and, and even just conceptualizing a dashboard. And I do think it's really important that as faculty, we, we think through how to be thoughtful around that data, because these are human beings, right? And, and we, need to be, we need to humanize the internet as much as possible. We need to humanize this technology. And, and that's what our role is as faculty, is to be able to take that data and, and, and recognize, okay, what could be happening here? Um, but let's talk to the students directly. Let's figure out how to do these uh, interventions in, in a reasonable manner and, and make sure we're checking and, and held accountable for that. 
And I don't want to put all of that on faculty either, right? Um, and there's hopes that there are administrators possibly on this call as well to think about how can we support ourselves as educators, as a community of educators to make meaning of this data and make meaning of it effectively and well so that we're not marginalizing students even more or pigeonholing them or creating numbers, right? Uh, to human faces. So there is definitely a place for us to increase our capacity in doing that, but not doing it in a siloed way or feeling in an isolated way. Um, so that's something that we are working on and we all need to be thinking about, whether it's adaptive learning technology or just your institutional <laughs> research department handing you a bunch of data on your student demographics. We all need to think through how do we make meaning well to that, to that data. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, I mean, again, excellent points. So I, I really want to reiterate, start small, prototype it, maybe even what we did with some of our instructors where we uh, asked several students to, to, to come for practice lessons and our instructors actually prototype the lessons with them just to see how they feel and so on as well. So start small because as you really think about it, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be considered and you need to become familiar with as an instructor, right, or as a faculty member. There's, of course, the technology piece, you know, everybody thinks that's, uh, uh, I mean, the technology has to be easy to use, you have to be familiar with it, and you have to understand what does it mean when students are on different levels at the same time. But these are actually not, in my opinion, not the, the hardest things. So, you know, you also have to consider, okay, how do you create active learning experiences around this? And doing good active learning takes a lot of hard work. So I think one of the lessons I want to say, adaptive active learning is not easy. It takes a lot of hard work to do it right. All right. So what can we do to get a little head start on this? So as Susan said, start small, look at the APLU guides. So look what other people have been doing successfully. Talk to them as well, because uh, there are a lot of lessons that uh, we learned along the way. So maybe you don't have to repeat this lessons as well. And something, you know, I want to really uh, reiterate is that you're not alone. Right. This is uh, can and I would even claim that uh, it's very hard to do on your own. So, so who can you tap into at your institution or within, even within your course or in your class to help you? So think about, uh, okay, so faculty, colleagues, uh, think about teaching assistants. Uh, often we do have used undergraduate uh, assistants as well. So st uh, students who might be a little bit further uh, along in the program, they come in and help with some of the facilitation techniques. Uh, as we, uh, Megan and Susan said, you have often instructional support staff like instructional designers, instructional technologists, and so on. For the data, we are very fortunate to have our uh, institutional research group. So maybe a data analyst, you know, can help you with uh, making meaning out of the different data that's uh, available and so on. And depending on how much you decide on developing materials yourself, you know, you might want to tap into, uh, you know, the media group that you have available. Um, uh, graphic designers, videographers, and these kind of things as well. So what really is uh, adaptive active learning is uh, it's not an individual sport, it's a team sport. And uh, I'm a big soccer fan, so I love that, uh, that analogy all the time. So there are different roles you have to play. All right, thank you, Peter. And we've got a couple of questions and uh, I'll address them as, as they make sense in terms of the conversation. And, and I do think one of them does right now. And uh, that is a question of cost. Um, and uh, certainly cost to student often comes up, uh, but you know, in terms of thinking about working, you know, just with an individual faculty or just on a, a specific module of a course. Uh, Peter, I know ASU has been building out its uh, active and adaptive program to build out capacities and infrastructure for, for years now, right? Um, so obviously there's there's the, the institutional um, considerations to be made. This takes time, energy, resources, building out capacities and knowledge and, and, and you know, and some of these things either don't exist on a campus yet, or, you know, you've got all of the maybe resources there, but they're not necessarily being targeted towards this. Um, how, are, how are you folks uh, approaching that? Or, or how would you respond to this question in terms of, you know, uh, what does it cost? And, and not necessarily a specific number, but things that should be considered by folks as they're thinking about planning this out from an, from an institution-wide approach, or even just working within a, a specific program. 
Yeah, great question. Something that we uh, get asked all the time, particularly with the number of students and the number of adaptive courses and the different models of adaptive implementation that we have. So I think probably the, hard, uh, the, the highest cost is the onboarding or the initial stage phase, if you want to say so. So and there are different models that you can use. So they're often there. Are, I would call it the out of the box model, uh, you know, where you have to can buy a product that has some kind of adaptivity and that you just need to configure. Uh, so what you need to do as an instructor or as instructor with your team, you need to review it, you need to uh, make decisions about what uh, learning objectives will be addressed, uh, what materials will be there, how it will integrate with your uh, other materials that you have as well. So that takes time. Uh, in general, I say I minimum recommend, I recommend minimum of three months and probably $5,000, but that's probably at the lowest level, right? On the other hand of the spectrum, the probably is uh, where you, um, uh, where you start from scratch, there's no existing material and you decide uh, as a team to build an adaptive platform, uh, adaptive course, you know, you may, may uh, work with one of the adaptive platforms that are out there, but you create everything ranging from videos, assessment items to, to graphics, to text and so on. So we have done that as well. And in general, we say it costs about $150,000 to do so. Time-wise, uh, I, I, uh, the average is between nine and 18 months to do so. So it's quite the, uh, the range that we have, quite the range of cost. But if you have to really think about and do the math on this, right? So, you know, the return on investment, if you want to say so, is you know, the outcomes are beneficial for the university and, you know, even, you know, uh, make this money uh, worth it, if you want to see, if you talk about retention numbers and these kind of things, just by looking at the scale that we have. So we, we do some creative accounting there as well. And uh, we are making sure that uh, we, I guess, recuperate the investment and it's worth it. And so we make sure that it's channeled in the right direction. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Susan, anything else you'd like to add here? Yeah, I wasn't sure if the question would come down to what the students have to pay for it as well. I think that might be an added I extra I piece. <laughs> I think um, that's so important, yeah. I, yeah, I've seen anywhere from actually just $25, right? So bringing that down from a $200, you know, huge textbook cost down to $25 to getting the code to access the software. Um, and then that varies, of course, across. So I've seen anywhere from 25 to 75, but it really doesn't go much past that, um, which, it, which is a great thing to see in the marketplace right now for the students' impact in terms of cost. Yeah, yeah we've definitely seen um, either at the same value or even less than in terms of the costs, um, because it's basically the, it's, it's not a replacement of the textbook, but that's like the cost replacement, right, for students. And most of the institutions we've been working with, we've, we've seen different approaches to this. For instance, um, an institution might have a textbook fee and then they, or a tech fee, and they allocate it for that purpose for the students. So they, they pay nothing out of pocket, or they just have the students, it's like a student purchasing their own books. Um, the other uh, consideration, I think, in terms of there's obviously the courseware itself that a student might be purchasing, but the, for those students who, um, you know, with, within these improved teaching models. We're finding that um, when done well, you have this uh, active and adaptive approach, more students are passing their course. So you have less students failing, less students retaking those courses. And there's a cost uh, savings to students as well um, in, in that capacity as well. So uh, things that should also be considered. Um, you know, for our folks, uh, I know we've got folks who are uh, faculty and instructional designers and faculty uh, development folks um, on on with us today, um, you know, and, and really thinking about how they want to approach this work or get folks interested or informed about it, um, you know, or even just having faculty become aware and, and interested in this work. I'd like to just, uh, Peter, I'll start with you on this one. Um, how do how do folks get faculty to, uh, you know, adopt these approaches or, you know, get started on this? Yeah, in general, uh, and at ASU, uh, we have different approaches that we have. Uh, at some, uh, as I said originally, it was a direct intervention to improve uh, the learning experience and student success for our general education courses. So there was a strategic initiative uh, that was, uh, was sanctioned by the university, supported by the grant, and these kind of things. So, and, but that alone gave us a lot of momentum and people started looking at the success that we are having, having that other people wanted to participate, other instructors uh, participated and so on. So uh, that's 
automatically caught like particularly our success in biology caused us to expand this approach into the adaptive undergraduate online degree of biology which is uh, one of the fastest growing uh, and most successful online degrees for AC online and we have close to over 200 degree programs right now so so that's going to quite positive there. So there's a lot of word of mouth and we do have, uh, of course, a lot of research that's being conducted on this and, 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 and so on. So in general, uh, to get uh, other faculty uh, enthusiastic about it, have your champions uh, uh, share what they're doing, how it's beneficial to them, how it's helping them to be um, uh, better teachers, have your students share how it's beneficial to them and so on and how, how, the, how the approach is helping them. But then also back this up with the research and, uh, and numbers. So, and depending on stakeholders, you know, you might want to think about what numbers you want to present. You know, some people are interested more in, 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 in the financials, while other people are definitely more interested in like the research and the learning outcomes and so on as well. So. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Susan, I know you have a lot of experience with this too, not only at your role at uh, Achieving the Dream, but in your previous work at Portland State as well. Um, you know, really, talking to faculty um, to get them to understand and understand this work and what it is, what it looks like, what it takes um, and getting them, you know, started as well. How, how do you approach that? So we primarily work with community colleges. So we're in a little bit of a different space than ASU. Um, and we do find that finding those champions are really one great strategy to go with. Uh, we've also found that some departments have discovered adaptive technology, whether they were marketed to by an adaptive provider um, or a um, faculty member that was really just seeking different content and different delivery of their own content. So all of a sudden they've got this adaptive technology and didn't even tell their dean. <laughs> so it can happen sort of from the ground up as well, which I think to me, I just, uh, you know, smile at that, uh, at the innovation and, and the, the risk taking that many faculty are willing to take and, and try something out. Um, especially those, and we found that those that kind of try it out on their own have been really heartfelt in noticing that their students are struggling um, and that they are in large class sizes where they can't reach everybody. Um, and this was a solution for them to be able to do that. Um, so I think speaking to those benefits um, on a variety of levels is important for also uh, you to amplify on your campuses, again, and kind of connecting to where are the pain points um, in your student success and assessing that uh, clearly for yourselves and looking at the demographics and your community around your college uh, to be able to say, you know, what are our needs and who is our population? And getting to know the students first is really where you wanna start in deciding whether or not this is a technology that's gonna work best for you. Um, so that's a lot of what Achieving the Dream does. We come in and do a full assessment of the campus at a very intimate level to be able to look at what those gaps are and then help say, okay, well, here's your menu of items and adaptive technology is very much on that list. Um, and then we can speak to really personalizing that, that solution uh, to, to meet that, that gap that, that shows up in the assessment. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, one of the things that, and I think both ATD and APLU, we've done this in terms of, I would, I would say, our institutional coaching model, right, when we're working with um, the, the different universities and colleges that we are, is we often, we if, uh, you know, exemplars don't necessarily exist on the campus yet, we, we bring some in, right? Or finding out, you know, who's doing this work and who's doing it really well or who have good programs and setting up, um, you know, an event or a webinar or, you know, just some sort of educational programming where either the leadership themselves can learn a little bit more about it or, you know, inviting folks who you think might be receptive to it, whether they are deans or chairs or, you know, some of those faculty coordinators, you know, are kind of interested in doing a course or career curriculum redesign or alignment and thinking about technology in new ways, um, you know, starting with those folks and having a conversation about this. And one of the things that we often find is that, yes, we're, you know, we're talking about adaptive learning, but it's it's never about the, the technology. We are not techno solutionists here. Um, this is about an ecosystem approach. We are building out a robust and comprehensive ecosystem on your campus for your students to be supported and for the faculty to be supported as well in service of that work. And really thinking about 
how um, you can take this from an institutional approach. Uh, what resources do you have on campus? What are the things that you know? What are the things that you don't know? And who should you be talking to from the field to come in and help educate you? Um, and that's something that the Every Learner Everywhere Network helps do, along with some of our network partners in, in the conversations and uh, programming that we offer some of the institutions as well. Um, now, it's kind of speaking to uh, you know some of that techno solutionism. I'll do a little throwback on on that as uh, you know in terms of, I want to think about this with our, our, our folks here on the call today um, around the issue of equity and uh, we're going to focus a little bit on that uh, but also in, in terms of you know how faculty should be thinking about equity in the classroom as they're doing this because one of the things that uh, we're, we're doing this work in service of equity right we want our students to be doing better and we also understand that some students are disproportionately represented in um, you know potentially not doing as well in those courses um, you know how can faculty and institutions really center equity in this work or what are some of the questions and considerations they should be thinking about as they're approaching this work because again this is not a silver bullet it's not going to fix things and it might actually introduce new problems um, that could potentially perpetuate you know inequity in other ways so um, you know I'm just going to kind of open it up and, and and Susan feel free to respond from the from the heart today and how you're feeling on that <laughs> um, and uh, let's have some conversation around that part of me wants to lob it over to Peter first <laughs> Yeah, do you want me? Okay, I'm going sure, to get started then. And how, how about that? And then uh, let's have a conversation about this because this yeah. is a very current topic. And I mean, yeah. uh, that needs to be addressed as well as uh, also on the forefront of many people right now and yeah. very important. So so here's something, you know, I, uh, what, one of, again, we're going to come back to the data here. One of the, the benefits is really that we can uh, really understand how different people with different backgrounds are, are doing, right? So, and we can see this in uh, by uh, by group. We can see how they are doing, when they are doing, and these kind of things. So that allows us to really clearly understand the situation, right? So, and it's very granular that we can do that. So based on that, we and I don't think we have figured it out yet. And that's part of my my expanded role that I'm I'm fulfilling. It's like I really have to think about what are interventions, what are ways to to improve. Uh, what we're seeing in general across the board, adaptive, active, uh, is beneficial for everyone. But what we're seeing is that's not beneficial in the same rate for everyone. So that's important to understand. So yes, it's good, but not good for enough for everyone. So that's something that we need to do. And uh, Susan will appreciate that because as instructional designers, we are system thinkers. We are, we are thinking about instructions, but also, as, uh, also about other ways that we can uh, support our, uh, our students. And that might be something from how we advise them, how we communicate with them, how we um, uh, support financial models and these kind of things. But also going down, especially if we are developing the courses ourselves, we can really influence what's happening in the learning experience, like looking at visuals, uh, like who are people, like is, do we have an inclusive mindset, are people represented in, this, in the right way, do we draw from different uh, backgrounds and so on within the learning experience itself. So that's, we can influence this and we do this. And as you know, the field is doing a lot of work in that area, you know, this is the Peralta rubric that's uh, pretty uh, commonly used. Uh, but there are other ways that we are working with our courses. Uh, we actually do have a task force on that. And uh, uh, particularly our biology courses, again, are on the forefront of that to ensure our students, uh, our learning experience are inclusive. And so we do reviews before courses launch and we have people commenting on word choices, images, uh, icons, all these things. And that's uh, something we takes time, takes effort, but we are doing that and get started, getting started. I don't think we have found the solution yet, but we are, we are at least working on it. So I would love to hear Susan, how you think about this. Yeah, well, I think there's a, a deeper piece for me that I think about when I, we're doing a lot of work at Achieving the Dream around culturally responsive curriculum design and redesign. Um, and we're currently ad, uh, adapting the NYU Steinhardt's uh, culturally responsive scorecard, which helps bring to mind, you know, who is represented in our content, right, in our courses, um, but also what knowledge bases are, right? So when we are in a Eurocentric, white-centric um, ideology within our course content, 
you know, is that become that's the norm, that's that's what should be taught um, versus being able to say we have multiple cultures, we have multiple ways of thinking, we have multiple ways of knowing. So I think we are at a stage in our development right now of putting into question those Eurocentric ideas um, of how we learn, how we teach and uh, the content within our field. Um, so it's it's an edge right now. And I think it's an important uh, inquiry based space that we're in. Um, and that's where when I look at adaptive, I think about, you know, where can we shift some of that content? Um, and often these platforms allow for what we call open educational resources, which allows you to put in additional content and or make meaning of the content that is there in such a way that allows you to put to have the students say, wow, this is very Eurocentric. What does that mean for the field? Right, so that we're all in a community of learning together. And as faculty, we are facilitating that questioning that's going on in our world right now. Um, so that takes some support and some adaptability, <laughs> um, pun intended, for yourselves in thinking through, you know, how am I conceptualizing my field as a whole? Um, so I think that's, you know, we, we are all at the frontier mindset right now of that. Um, and I think it's a, it's a provocative question. Um, it's, it's an important dialogue. Um, and I'm thinking through as an instructional designer, as I noticed in the chat, someone said we're consultants, but, you know, we're also guides and we're also thought partners, you know? So it's not that Peter and I have all the answers, but we're in a space of saying we are open to and leaning into these harder questions. Well, thank you both um, for those comments. Uh, we've had a, a, at least a, another comment in the chat and as well in the Q&A that uh, referenced this as well, because I know we've been talking about, um, you know, certainly the uh, like issues of, of equity. We've already talked a little bit about access, but mostly in, in reference to cost, right? Um, but I, I want to talk about access in terms of accessibility uh, to students and ADA, um, as well as, um, you know, our, our neurodiversity and an ability of students as well as faculty to use these emerging technologies in the classroom, uh, whether it's online or in person and some of the limitations on that. Um, I guess, what, what are some of the, the issues that are kind of coming up for you? Do If, if you have data to kind of speak to this of or what conversations are happening on your campus or with with campus leaders uh, around these issues and how they're approaching this question <laughs> or, or, <laughs> Susan, why, Susan, why don't you take this one first so yeah, I help you out yeah, yeah. Time, so. so Megan can you can you reword that a little bit more for me <laughs> yeah, I wanted to get yeah. at the issue here because I've Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't hundred percent sure either. So thank yeah. you. I like, to, I like to feel my way around an idea <laughs> rather than being direct, <laughs> as you all know. Yeah. Um, but again, really just thinking about issues of accessibility for students. Oh, accessibility. Right? Accessibility okay. in the sense of, you know, whether it is an issue of uh, neurodiversity or physical limitations, et cetera, mm -hmm. for students, um, mm -hmm. especially when we are talking about these new technologies coming into the classroom, right? Um, and educational technology potentially having, you know, not being as accessible accessible to those students. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, what sort of things are popping up in, uh, you know, your conversations or on your campuses uh, around these issues or how you're handling that to ensure that they are accessible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've gotten a lot better, I will say. When we first started this at PSU, the accessibility question was just such a strong and, and challenge um, because literally these providers out of Silicon Valley were not doing it, right? And it was, we was pulling tooth and nail to get even um, and this is a hard one, but we ask them to have downloadable PDFs of the techno of the content for those students that need to use Dragon readers to be able to consume the content. And there, that's where the accommodation needs to come in. But we need the providers to offer that to us. We don't have the time to repurpose this content in such a way to meet all uh, the needs of, of students that need an accommodation. So I'm seeing much stronger um, that they are providing that type of technology. There are strategies that faculty can take, um, but I do, I blob it back to the provider of the courseware to provide that for us and give those alternatives um, to help us make those changes or help us provide what those accommodations are for the students. Um, so yeah, we do have to pivot even if it weren't an adaptive technology um, and the accommodations office are now getting more and more adept at being able to do that with the adaptive technologies. We're not fully there yet. Um, so there are times where there needs to be fully alternative assignments to the adaptive for certain students. Um, 
And so, but that does need to be placed into our planning of the course before it's deployed. Um, and and we're, we're still, and continuing to work on that, that I'm seeing in colleges. Thanks, Susan. Peter. Yeah, I think it's a very good summary of the status of where we are. You know, there definitely has been improvements over time. Uh, I think that's where really where the, uh, the, the power of a partnership between an educational institution and the technology provider comes into play. You know, technology providers don't necessarily think about these uh, these these issues as well as they're uh, they are not aware of how to address them. So, good thing is there are laws, right? So we are, you know, everybody has certain minimum expectations and so on. And uh, what we were able to do, we are very have a close relationship with our. Um, uh, DRC, which is our disability research center, and we are able to partner with our technology vendors in order to provide these accommodation accommodations necessary. In particular, when we, uh, if they are like uh, you know, they you know you can't you know often they're case by case basis, but we do our best as we develop the course the courseware to address. Uh, the, the, I guess the minimum standards, if you want to say so, like all text, uh, uh, readability with screen reader, and and all, and, you know, making sure that videos are have closed captioning and a transcript and all these kind of things. So, so there's a lot of resources flowing into that as well. At the same time, that does not cover every accommodation. So in that case, we are partnering with the vendors in order to make the learning experience uh, uh, the same, which is we are. Uh, required by law, right? So that's uh, that's what we're doing. But is it sometimes easy? No, it takes effort, right? So, and I have to say, I just want to applaud Peter and ASU. They have been such a strong leader in influencing the Silicon Valley developers, right? Because it's it's not an easy relationship, but it's gotten better over time. And I really believe that we can have a much stronger relationship with with Silicon Valley in higher education. And we, it's critical that we do. Um, and I just want to applaud you and Dale for, for forwarding that and being able to get into that arena of that kind of a conversation um, because of your resources, because it's trickling down to us um, in that way. So thank you for that. Yeah, there thank is a uh, power in community and also just an uh, openness and willingness to be having these conversations because it is vital, right? Um, it's not necessarily that, you know, a, a technology is handed over into an institution and it's, you know, that's it, right? That there is always room for improvement, um, you know, and even meeting the baseline standards of, you know, what's legal, still not good enough. We need to do better. Um, and we should be partnering with uh, our technology providers to really, you know, understand these critical issues of what this looks like in practice on a campus, how it's affecting students and faculty, and how to improve those so, you know, that they can help in that process as well. Yeah, we've definitely been thinking about how, you know, the, the Every Learner Network, as well as our different um, partner organizations as we're working with institutions is how do we capture those learnings and those struggles and articulate it and, and have those conversations with within the technology vendors uh, space as well to really think about how we can help drive this too because it is um, you know it is a relationship and it goes it goes both ways and we should be having an, an open and communicative conversation um, that is collaborative and in service of students and our institutions as well so um, thank you both and uh, you know for both of you for the work that you do um, you know you're you're both awesome. You've joined us this Friday afternoon as well. Um, I believe we are at time. So I'm going to go ahead and hand things back over to Norma. And again, thanks to our audience members for joining us today. Thank you so Have much. A great Megan. Weekend. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. You are on mute. <laughs> Okay, now we got it straight. <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, Megan, Peter, Susan. It was a wonderful conversation. I think that we really got some, some good information shared out there. Uh, and I hope this really engages a lot of our audience to you know, start considering that, that transition to active and adaptive learning, or if they are starting in that path, that they will be the champions to uh, bring everybody else on board that, that should be coming on board. Um, with that in mind, we ask that our participants, our audience, take a few minutes to complete our survey for today, today's presentation. The link is going to be provided for you in the chat. If you've got something going on immediately after, don't worry. We'll send you the link to the survey when we send you the recording um, next week. 
Um, I would also like to just thank our audience for, for participating and actively asking us questions and challenging us. Um, as a quick reminder, we do encourage you to visit the Every Learner Everywhere website and our resources page. You'll find some of those references that we talked about today in terms of the implementation guide and some of the case studies with ASU on our resources page. Uh, we also encourage you to um, visit our expert network webpage if you've got questions about digital learning and equity and would like to sign up for our coaching sessions. Again, thank you very much to Megan, our moderator, and Susan and Peter, our panelists. Thank you to our audience for participating in today's discussion. We look forward to seeing you April 2nd for our next webinar, Designing with Quality and Engagement at the Forefront. You all have a wonderful weekend and, and thank you very much.